is my very great pleasure tonight to welcome you to BWM EDGE here at Federation Square for this feature event of the Sustainable Living Festival. And in so doing, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we stand and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Respecting the rights and contributions of Indigenous people has been an increasingly important aspect of international development. My name is Professor Margaret Abernethy, and I am Dean of the Faculty of Business and Economics at the University of Melbourne. And it's a great honour to be here tonight to welcome you to the 31st in this national forum series called One Just World. It is sponsored by the Australian Government's International Development Agency, AusAid, in partnership with International Women's Development Agency and World Vision. These organizations are joined together by a university partner in each city, and here in Melbourne, it is the University of Melbourne. For this forum, Oxfam Australia are also joining us, and I'd like to thank them. Now, One Just World is about providing a platform for ideas and conversations about important development issues and how these might be addressed. To enable you in the audience to talk directly with those involved in development, make your own suggestions, and find out more ways in which you can get involved. Our newspapers and our TV screens regularly report on global poverty. We all sit there and we listen and watch and are concerned and appalled at the shocking images that confront us. But sometimes we don't know what to do. It seems like it's out there and over there and somehow removed from us and our lives in Australia. Tonight, our speakers will be challenging us as individuals to reflect on our own personal obligations as individual Australians towards the global poor. I expect some very interesting discussions and debate, and we have a roving mic to make sure that we involve you in this conversation. So let me now introduce you to the marvelous Liz Jackson, our moderator for the evening. Liz is known to many of you. She is a reporter and presenter for the ABC Television's Four Corners program. Liz graduated with first class honors in philosophy and literature at the University of Melbourne before studying law in London at the Inns of Court School of Law. She was admitted to the Bar of England and Wales in 1978, working as a shopfront law lawyer at Brixton Community Law Centre in London until 1982. When she returned to Australia, Liz became a legal advisor in the New South Wales Premier's Department before going on to join the ABC in 1986. During her time with the ABC Radio National, Liz presented the Coming Out Show, the Law Report, and background briefing before joining ABC's television Four Corners in 1994. Liz spent a year in 2005 as presenter of the ABC's Media Watch program before returning to her role as reporter and presenter for Four Corners. Liz has won eight Walkley Awards for Excellence in Journalism, including the Gold Walkley Award in 2006. I have no question in mind that Liz has seen her share of interesting debate and discussion, and we could have no one better to begin this conversation than Liz. I turn over to you, Liz, as um, facilitator for the night. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret, for that generous introduction. Um, good evening, everybody, and it's fabulous to see such a great crowd who've come tonight to discuss what is obviously some of the very biggest and most challenging questions that face us all, and ones that we in the developed world often choose not to think about. So I think it's fabulous that the debate has been, uh, the forum has been organised, and I'm delighted to do my best in what is a difficult and complex and challenging subject, I think, for, for us all to consider. I mean, tonight's particular forum is who should get what and why? 
And those are all particularly interesting questions. I mean, who should we be aiding? In what way and why? And critically important, I think, for tonight's discussion is, and how? What, what are the effective ways? What have we learned in the years that the world has been looking at this subject? What have we learned about what is the way forward? And that's what we'll be asking this fabulous panel that we have here tonight. I mean, the huge disparity between rich and poor is not new, but some of the things that are now pressing on that issue are things that, that are new, and they're things like an appreciation of the impact of climate change, an appreciation of what it means the, to have undergone the global financial crisis. And so those are some of the subjects that we will be talking about tonight. But first, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And we're fortunate to have a fabulous group whose breadth of expertise and experience should make for an excellent discussion. So I'd like to introduce you to them. First, I'd like to introduce the Honourable Amelia Perez, the Minister for Finance for Timor-Leste, perhaps best known to folk here as East Timor. Newly independent in 2002, Timor-Leste is often described as one of the poorest countries in the world. Prior to becoming Finance Minister, Ms Perez was a Senior Coordination Advisor to the United Nations Integrated Mission in East Timor. And last year, she was elected by 45 nations to co-chair the International Dialogue on Peace Building and State Building. And also, and Amelia will be talking about this later, selected to chair the small G7, she tells me you have to say it's the small G7, plus of fragile states, which is an independent forum of fragile and conflict-affected countries and regions that have united to form a collective voice. On a personal note, um, the eldest of seven children, Amelia travelled with her family here in 1975 as a refugee. She obtained a mathematics degree, did postgraduate studies in Melbourne, and then a Master of Science in Development Management from the London School of Economics. She now has over 25 years management of management, community planning and development experience, which includes senior posts with the United Nations and the World Bank. Please give Amelia Perez a warm welcome. <laughs> Our next guest all the way from New York is Mary Ellen Iskanderian. Mary Ellen is President and CEO of the Women's World Banking, or WWB, which is the world's largest network of microfinance institutions and banks. She joined the WWB in 2006 and currently heads the global team. Prior to this, she spent 17 years at the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank. She also worked for the investment bank Lehman Brothers in less notorious <laughs> times, I imagine. Dearly departed. <laughs> yeah, she, and currently serves on the board of Cash, which is the microfinance bank in Pakistan and is a permanent member of the Council of Foreign Relations. She holds a Master's of Business Administration from the Yale School of Management and a Bachelor of Science in International Economics from Georgetown University. Please welcome Mary Ellen Eskandarian. <laughs> Ross Buckley, on my left, is Professor of International Finance at the University of New South Wales. He joined the faculty in 2007, having previously led a research centre into global trade and finance at another university for six years. He currently edits two book series, one on global trade law and another on international banking law for the prestigious Kluwer Law International Publishers. His work focuses on ways to improve the regulation and resilience of national financial systems and the global financial system. He's acted as a consultant to government departments in Australia, Indonesia, Vietnam and the United States, as well as banks and finance houses in Australia and the United Kingdom. Please welcome Professor Ross Buckley. And finally, Andrew Hewitt, the Executive Director of Oxfam Australia, since October 2001. His previous positions with Oxfam include leadership of the agency's advocacy program and the director of Oxfam International's response to the crisis in East Timor from 1999 to 2001. Andrew was a member of the World Bank NGO Committee for four years and has participated in numerous international conferences, including those organised by the World Trade Organisation and the World Bank. He's Vice President of the Australian Council for International Development, the Peak Council of Non-Government Development Agencies. He's also co-chair of the Make Poverty History Campaign and a member of BHB Billiton Forum for Corporate Responsibility. I hope you're putting the hard word on them with that massive six-month, $10 billion profit, Andrew. You could, you could use some of that. 
Andrew has visited programs run by Oxfam Australia and Asia, Africa and Pacific. Please welcome Andrew Hewitt. As Margaret emphasised, we are, I'd like to reassure you that everybody who's come tonight, that we have set aside, we're hoping to set aside about half an hour for you to ask your questions. Um, and we welcome questions from all different perspectives. So it would be great if you've got any questions, have a think while people are talking. And as I said, there'll be a roving mic and we're really keen for you to, to participate tonight. But before that, we, we start... I'd like to start with a general discussion and hear from our panellists one by one. And Andrew Hewitt, if I could start by asking you, I'm interested that the discussion we're having here tonight is not framed in terms of why the rich should aid the poor, but instead in terms of why we should provide economic justice. And I wondered if you could explain that for me, spell that out. Well, I think that's been a really important trend in a lot of debate over the last few years, is that uh, on a global basis, we are hearing voices crying out loud and clear that what we want is economic justice. And for economic justice, I think that's raising two very important issues. One, it's talking about rights, uh, people's rights to a sustainable livelihood, to decent work, to control over resources, those sorts of basic fundamental human rights. But we're also talking about uh, equity and, about it, and associated that with equality, understanding that the gap between rich and poor has widened uh, and that if we are going to find a, a way out of poverty, that we need to have a focus on equality as much as we have a focus explicitly on poverty. Uh, it's a reality now that three quarters of the people who are classified as be living in absolute poverty live in so-called middle-income countries. Uh, and that's a fundamental change in the way that we see the world. Uh, so there's still obviously many least developed countries, but uh, one of the f uh, consequences of the growth or the patterns of economic growth and economic development over the last few years has been that widening gap between rich and poor. Mary Ellen, I wondered if you could tell us why, in terms of looking at issues about the rich and poor, why it was felt important to set up a specific women's bank, why, why, why the specific gender focus, and whether or not the original rationale still holds true. Oh, ab absolutely, <laughs> to that, that last question. Um, Women's World Banking was really conceived at the first UN conference on human rights for women in Mexico City in 1976, where a group of women came together and realized that women would never really truly have full human rights if that they did not have economic rights and the access to their own financial independence and the ability to make their own financial decisions. So over the course of the next three years, uh, these women came together and pretty much in some senses collided with the microfinance movement, which was getting started at right at the same time. And so in, in 1979, it was very much with the intention of women helping other women to fully realize those rights that Women's World Banking was born. Um, today, as you mentioned in your, in your remarks, we are a network of 39 microfinance institutions and banks in 27 developing countries, all of whom, and they, are, they range from full-fledged banks to savings cooperatives to uh, uh, NGOs, a whole range of legal structures but all of the organizations in the WWB network are committed to providing access to financial services and products to low-income entrepreneurs with a particular focus on women and their households. And as I imagine we'll talk a little bit uh, throughout the afternoon, that need is absolutely as great as it was back in 1976 because we've seen as microfinance has in some ways been a victim of its success. Uh, it's very commercially viable now. There, there is a, a great deal of investment capital flowing into the sector. We've seen the business model really move up market to a great degree, and unfortunately, away from women clients to a very great degree. So what the percentage of people who actually get the microfinance um, loans nowadays has dropped in proportion to the, to the total amount of loans that are given? Well, in terms of, of women, yes, you've seen a very uh, stark, very dramatic drop off in the percentage of women clients that are served by microfinance institutions. I should say, commercial capital has been 
the greatest engine of growth for the microfinance industry. You've seen great growth in the, those institutions that have made that shift. And in some cases, you've really seen the absolute number of women grow in terms of being served by those institutions. But that growth is greatly outstripped by the increase in growth in male borrowers. So we're, and again, we can, we can talk a bit about why it remains so important that women have access to capital because of the way they spend their money when they are uh, empowered to, to have economic independence. Yeah, well, I think we should, have, should explore that later, actually, because Great. people might think, well, why should they get more money? <laughs> <laughs> well, Pro Professor Buckley-Ross, could you tell us what you feel has been the biggest lessons learned over the years in which this, this issue has been addressed about what's the biggest lesson in terms of how to effectively deliver aid and where have we got it wrong and where are we getting it right? I think we've learned a lot about aid and development assistance and I think in my experience there's a big gap between what most people think aid is and, and what it generally is these days. Generally in my experience it's much more longer term programs focused on empowering countries to be able to do things better themselves. It's, it's much more focused on capacity building and some of the development projects I've been involved in are really, really effective. I, I don't think the problem so much is at the aid end of the spectrum. I think the challenges are in the framework. You know, our global economic framework, our trade arrangements are desperately unfair, our financial arrangements are desperately unfair, and these are the things that mean that the playing field is never level and developing countries have huge challenges. It's not that the, the problem is not, in my experience, with the individual aid projects or the individual entities delivering those projects. I think we've learned an awful lot about that. But we haven't reformed the World Trade Organization, we haven't reformed the international financial system, and that's the source of the injustice globally. Thanks. And finally, Amelia, speaking from your perspective as finance minister of one of the world's poorest nations, are you optimistic about the preparedness of the rest of the world to actually address the issues that people are saying need to be addressed. I mean, what's, what's your sense of how it's going as a, as a recipient? Uh, from my experience, uh, and you mentioned it before, that we are now part of the little G7. The reason why the little G7 was born is because we don't actually believe that the world will, ch will change if we don't do something about it. And this is why countries like ours small, poor countries, beneficiaries of aid. I tell, from, for example, in Timor-Leste, from 99 to 2007, there were $8 billion uh, invested in Timor-Leste in terms of humanitarian aid and development assistance. But poverty doubled in many of our regions to, to 50% in some areas. So something must have gone wrong. And, and nowadays, Timor-Leste is actually leading this uh, little G7 plus um, forum, which is made up of 17 nations facing similar problems to actually uh, help uh, the dialogue between us and the developed countries on looking for mint and ways on how to, to, to fix this problem, because it's not working. And, and that's the experience, and we need to, to do something about it. And right now we are in this process whereby we think that the answer is not only in the developed countries, it is also within us. What is it that we have to do to ensure that we guide the aid in a better way? Uh, and then we, we come in together to strengthen our voice so that it can be heard. I mean, have you identified any, any specific reasons why? I mean, why, well, why that didn't work? Because I mean, I think that's something people find really dispiriting, and they feel that aid's given and, and poverty gets worse. Yeah, it's probably the how. Uh, right now, we have four working groups. One of one of them is on the planning, because we do hear a lot from the develop, developed country side that when they come into the developing country, the developing country does not have a plan, and therefore they don't know where to actually target their aid. So it's all over the place, uncoordinated, and therefore it doesn't actually produce at the end of the day, and nobody owns the process. And so there is a working group looking at this planning. Who should lead that plan? Should it, obviously, it should be the recipient country, and then therefore everybody else can follow that plan and implement that plan. Then maybe we can see more results. 
The other working group is on the aid instruments. Are they working? Because at the moment we have, for example, you know, let's take Timor-Leste again. Uh, uh, the money doesn't come straight to the country. It doesn't come to my treasury. Everybody manages their money. And therefore, it's, it's impossible to actually coordinate this. And sometimes you make a plan and you need that money to be implemented today or tomorrow. It only comes the year after. And so it just loses its momentum, loses its, its uh, effectiveness. And then there's another um, uh, uh, working group on political dialogue, because there has to be political will at the highest level for the, all these things to, to be implemented. I can't remember yeah. the third. <laughs> Does any of this sound familiar to you, Andrew? Uh, desperately f familiar. Uh, just on the question of coordination, for instance, uh, this is supposedly an area that uh, aid donors have been trying to get their act together. But I remember a colleague of mine was about two, two or three years ago was meeting uh, a minister in the Laotian government, uh, I think uh, uh, in the agricultural department, and his department that previous year had hosted 328 separate donor visits. Uh, and that's a department which would have li very limited human capacity to actually manage that donor relationship. Uh, but they had to use their more senior staff to relate to donors. Donors basically had different standards of reporting, demanded direct engagement, there was little coordination. And that's repeated time after time after time again. The international community, through the Paris Declaration, through the mechanisms that uh, Amelia was talking about, it, has signed up for a greater level of coordination. But I think there's been a, quite a gap between the promising and the delivery. In terms of impacts that, you, that, that are affecting people's lives presently in East Timor, has the global financial crisis in a sense, exacerbated the kinds of problems you're talking about, or, or, or are you not just not in feeling Tim it? In Timor Leste, we've been fortunate. For on one hand, uh, when the, the uh, global financial crisis was happening, I was actually reading the newspapers about it, and then reading the reactions of, of the norm, uh, ordinary citizen in countries where where uh, 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 there was a huge big impact. And then I asked myself the question, what are they on about? This is what we in Timor-Leste have been experiencing in the last 400 years. And, and why did I say that? It's because we are, more, we are not integrated into the global economy, and therefore there was no such big impact except on our uh, gas and oil revenues. But then on the other hand, there's a little bit of a paradox in there as well, because as the dollar, uh, uh, with the global financial crisis, uh, the, the, the price of the oil also went down and then it's gone up, even though the dollar is down, but for us it kind of works uh, on the uh, positive side rather than the negative side, so it's a bit... So uh, you're waiting to get integrated into the world economy so that you can be well, affected we have to by be the world's careful. global we financial <laughs> crisis? No, is we that? have to be very careful because uh, as you get integrated, you, you, situation, that's why we want to change the yeah, global no. system so that when we get to that stage where we get integrated, we won't suffer like everybody else suffers. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I understand. And what's been your experience, Mary Ellen? I mean, has it affected the, the kinds of loans that you're able to give and the amount of money that's flowing around? Or the Microfinance, you know, knock on wood, has actually been, um, as an industry, has really been quite resilient coming out of the, the global financial crisis. Um, you know, sort of initially late 2008, early 2009, you saw the populations that microfinance serves really having already been weakened by the food and fuel crises of that, that previous year and then sort of going into the financial crisis. At least the, you know, 39 institutions in the WWB network, I think were very wise in sort of slowing growth going back to basics in terms of credit analysis. For example, we had some institutions that you know, didn't do a proper credit analysis for repeat borrowers. So they cut that out, they went right back to their knitting, and actually, as a result, really were able to, um, to respond quite, quite effectively to the crisis. Um, just a little bit of a, uh, a pitch for the Women's World Banking Network. 
there's one investable index in microfinance called the SIM 50, 50 institutions that are the leading <laughs> institutions in the, in the industry, the largest that have the, uh, take up a lot of the commercial capital coming into the sector. The return on equity of those institutions coming out of the, the crisis 2009 was 2.1%. The WWB network, which and, and the percentage of women borrowers of those 50 is only 52%. The Women's World Banking Network, roughly 40 institutions, 82% women, and an ROE for that same period of time at 17.1%. We had very similar kinds of improvements in terms of uh, portfolio quality, and the size of loans that were made by the WWB network were, were more than half as large, so much more likely to be going to women borrowers than to men, than that, that group of 50. So I think they're really, from, from our perspective, became a really clear business case for microfinance institutions to continue to do business, even in times of distress for the global financial system. Do folk generally understand microfinancing? I mean, I had, I Googled it up before I came tonight, so <laughs> I'm, I just think, I mean, people understand the rationale of, of devoting small amounts of money to, directly to people, and that that's, yep. Oh, you're all far better informed than I am. <laughs> Andrew, can you speak, when we were speaking earlier, you were saying that in your experience, in fact, the global financial crisis has had a very significant impact from Oxfam's perspective? Well, it's had, it's had an impact on different groups of people in different places around the globe. Uh, we did a, a study in about 12 countries, uh, developing countries, looking at different communities who've been affected by, or who thought could have been affected by the, the global financial crisis. What came through uh, were a couple of things. One, people didn't necessarily identify what was happening to them as a result of the financial crisis. It could have been the increases in food prices, it could have been the increases in fuel prices, it could have been the impacts of climate change. They saw that as, it was almost like a perfect storm. They were going to be hit by one or other, and in some instances, more than one of those trends. But to back up Amelia's point, uh, those economies uh, which were more integrated in the global economy were less affected by the global financial crisis. Uh, but they could have been affected by the increases in food prices and fuel prices. But uh, those economies which were integrated to some degree in the global economy were hit hard. Uh, and as is often the case, uh, those who were hit hardest tended to be the people at the bottom of the pile and tended to disproportionately be women. Uh, so, for instance, you go to Cambodia and 30,000 garment workers lost their jobs. Uh, go to India and you're talking in the, sim the same industry, uh, hundreds of thousands of women lost their jobs. Uh, and that's, that's a trend and it's, it's exacerbated by some of the responses of the rich world to, to the global financial crisis. Uh, so for instance, between the first meeting of the G20 and a meeting of uh, about six months later, 19 out of the 20 G20 countries introduced new measures of protectionism which would only have one impact on people in developing countries and that would be worse than their plight. And it exacerbated uh, the, the basic unfairness, the rigged rules and the double standards of the world trading system. Uh, and it exacerbated the overall economic picture that we face. That's an extraordinary figure. 19 out of the 20 That's countries right. there introduced yep. new protectionist barriers. Yep. So I wasn't aware of that. And this is despite the grand rhetoric this is the grand uh, rhetoric that open barriers are going to allow the developing indeed. world to sell to the developed world. But yep. it's, it's, been a, it's been a long battle in any event, right? Yeah. The rhetoric and reality gap got a little bit wider. Got a bit wider. Ross Buckley, what, what's been your experience? I mean, what, what do you think that the present, you know, the issue of the global financial crisis has done in terms of exacerbating the issues that face the developing world in terms of poverty reduction? I think, I think the global food crisis, I suppose it depends whether you roll them in as mm. the same thing or not, but I think the, the run-up in food prices has been a more pressing issue for a lo lot of countries. I think that's been you know, extraordinarily damaging. Can you tell us about uh, that, yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's, mm. to be honest, not exactly my expertise. I mean, I'm not sure of why, what's gone on with the food prices, but I know the impact of that has been very, very severe. I think on the 
global financial crisis, it really does raise the issue of how integrated developing countries need to be in, in the global financial system. You know, there's a, there's a very strong case. The international institutions, particularly the International Monetary Fund, but also the World Bank, pushes liberalisation, pushes developing countries to uh, reduce capital controls and, and integrate into global finance. Um, you know, but earlier, well, last year, I was, I was speaking to the, the fellow who'd been the central bank governor of India for many years, a very famous um, central bank governor. And, uh, and he, when the international institutions were pushing him to, lib to liberalise India's financial markets and let the foreign banks in, he, he, and all the banks were pushing him, he said, well, show me a study that proves my country will be better off if, you know, we let foreign capital flow in freely, you know, without any impediments. And nobody ever could. It, it's, it's deeply problematic whether a country is better served opening itself up to foreign capital until the day comes when it can regulate its financial markets really well. And most developing countries haven't got the people power, they haven't got the expertise and the skills on the ground to be able to regulate capital movements. Has that been your experience, Amelia? I mean, does this sound familiar to you? Or? I was just going to pick up on what Andrew was saying. Uh, with the commodity price going up, the same thing happened to Timon. But we, the government, took a decision very quickly, very early when we saw it coming. Uh, we knew that the rice price was going to go up and most of our people depend on that. So we, we took a measure whereby we created a destabilization fund and we intervened in the market. And we were highly criticized by the IMFs and all these other institutions. We had big fights. And then at the end of the day, we went ahead with it. Uh, and of, uh, obviously, we didn't suffer like many other countries. We were watching how many other countries, there were riots, social unrest, and this didn't happen to Timor. And, and, uh, and here we, we face the international institutions because they do not understand. Uh, and, and therefore, they apply the theory that may work normally, but it's in the wrong context. Yeah. I wondered if in some way there might be some upside though, um, Ross, insofar as there now seems to be a greater preparedness to introduce regulation into global, the, the movement of money globally. I mean, there's, there's always been a, um, from way back, an idea that there should be some sort of tax or some sort of price to pay when, when um, those transactions are made. But I wondered if now, because of the, the idea that perhaps too many of the regulations were abandoned, that there was an upside in terms of a greater regulation and a greater control of capital in and out of countries. In a lot of countries, there's a strong, particularly in Europe, there's a strong feeling that the banks brought, largely brought about this crisis. So the banks should contribute to its resolution and the banks should have more regulation on what they, what they do. Um, sadly, that's essentially a European phenomenon at the moment. I mean, I think our political leaders in this country are terrified of the political power of the banks. And in the United States, um, Barack Obama supported some of these ideas when he was a candidate for president and has never breathed a word about them since he's actually sat in the White House, which probably also says something about the political power of the US banks. So there's a sort of a, a bit of a schism around the world at the moment. There is quite a, quite a strong push for more regulation and more contribution by banks to um, national economies in Europe, but it's not reflected in other places. I wondered just generally just to, to move the discussion along, I wondered how folk here felt that the Millennium Goals had, you know, to what extent the, the fact that the world agreed that we would adopt these, these eight goals in terms of the eradication of extreme poverty and all children going to primary school and maternal health and infant mortality and, and you know, a set of very precise measurements. And I wondered if people had felt that the adoption of those Millennium Goals had actually delivered real benefits, Mary Ellen. Certainly, you know, the world community coming together around a set of explicit goals and setting very defined targets in terms of, of dates for their achievement, I, I think is, is an absolutely admirable goal. Unfortunately, um, the MDGs that explicitly relate to women have been amongst the ones that have the least progress made against them, but I'd argue, Every single one of the eight 
would be better achieved and more efficiently achieved if there were particular attention paid to women in the achievement of those goals. So I, I'm an optimist by nature, but I am I'm worried about our ability to, to achieve the MDGs. Could you spell out the argument as to why you feel it is important that they specifically look at impact on women? I mean, can, can you make your case for... Well, you know, for example, um, in fact, we were talking to some folks about this earlier today. Uh, you know, if you go to the MDG conference uh, that was held in, in September, there's a general feeling that the primary education goal is probably amongst the eight the one that is, is, has made the most progress. And in fact, a lot of discussion about, well, maybe we can move into secondary and tertiary education, don't need to be thinking about primary education. But people are, are not, and, and I, I fear that this is the case in so often in development, looking at that goal with a gender lens. There is still a tremendous divide in primary education for girls and primary education being provided for boys. And while we have made progress for boys and some for girls, there's still quite a disparity between um, girls and boys. And what I think is even a bit more dispiriting is that at the same time, we've seen some very compelling information about what only one more year of additional education for a girl can mean in terms of her lifespan, the lifespan of any children that she ultimately has, her, the, the likelihood that she will die in childbirth or actually uh, live to, to see another day, um, and the ultimate earning power that she will have as an economic agent and of her children. So the impact of that additional year of girls' education on the entire family and the family yet unborn is so extraordinary that it is, it's worrisome that the, uh, the return on investment is so clear and yet the investment might not be being made. And is that your experience, Amelia? With the MDGs, I'm a, I'm a very big supporter of the MDGs, but for countries like ours who are not even yet there because we are still post-conflict, in the International Dialogue for Peace Building and State Building that I co-chair with uh, U the UK, what we are also pushing is for some other new goals that says for us to actually even achieve the MDGs, we need to have peace and stability first. Right. So we are actually having this dialogue. But, then on the, uh, but now let's talk about the MDGs. My own experience, I chaired, I, I'm the chairperson for the MDGs in Timor-Leste. And it was interesting because everybody talks about the MDGs, but the people themselves who are supposed to be getting themselves out of the poverty, getting the education, do not know about the MDGs. Now, that's a big problem. So I don't know how many people here know about the MDGs, but on my way here, I was reading, I was trying to do a bit of research, and I, I, was, I picked up on the United Nations in 1998, for example, uh, in the United Nations report that said something like, uh, at that time, we only needed globally $9 billion extra to ensure that everybody in the developing countries could access basic sanitation and water. Only $9 billion. In that same year, we spent $11 billion in ice cream in Europe alone. Now, if we all knew that, maybe we would have given up our ice cream to allow these pe other people, little children, to access water. In that same year, there was, we needed only about $6 billion to ensure that all little children could have uh, access to primary, uh, universal primary education. U.S. alone spent $8 billion on cosmetics. So now I'm going to feel twice when I want to buy the lipstick. Like, this is what's happening with the world, because information. We don't know what we do every day and how it impacts on the other side. And I think we need to do something about that, because sometimes we don't even f finish the ice cream, we throw it away. Somebody goes without water and sanitation. Well, perhaps we need to talk about new sources of money. And I mean, I think one of the sources of literally billions of dollars that's put up and, and is discussed and I understand is something that's hoped for is what's called the Robin Hood tax. Now, I think it's going to be better if somebody other than me has a go at it. <laughs> I'll give it to you, Ross. <laughs> it's not that hard, really. 
It's, um, it's a financial transactions tax. It's a very small tax on all wholesale capital markets transactions. So and we're talking really small, maybe five one hundredth of one percent, down as low as five one thousandths of one percent, but it would apply and it wouldn't apply when you borrow money from the bank. It would apply when uh, banks raise capital themselves, and it would apply to all speculative trading in global financial markets. So it's not a new idea. Keynes suggested we needed one back in the 1930s. Um, it's an outgrowth of a currency transactions tax, which was the idea of James Tobin, a US economist. And I think this is the really important thing. Tobin came up with the idea of a currency transactions tax not to raise money. He came up with the idea to improve the operation of the foreign currency markets, which he saw in the early 70s were characterized by too much speculation. And so this is one of these sorts of taxes, like taxes on alcohol or tobacco, or like the congestion tax on the streets of London. It's a tax that's really primarily not designed to raise money. It's, a, it's designed to do something else. In this case, it's designed to help financial markets do what their core job is. And their core job is deciding who gets capital. Right? Every economy needs financial markets because you, know, you need banks to decide that you know, Andrew has a lousy idea for a business and he shouldn't get the money, and Amelia has a great idea and she should get the money. That's the core purpose of a financial sector. And uh, what's happened in the last sort of 20 to 30 years is our financial sectors have moved a long way away from that. 70% of trading in US equities is computer-driven trading today. Something like 40% of the trades in US equity markets, the asset is bought and held and sold in less than a second, in fractions of a second. Goldman Sachs have moved their computers to the same building as the major online exchange because they have worked out every thousandth of a second they save is worth $100 million a year to them. Hedge funds in Paris now have to have their computers in London because they were at a competitive disadvantage for the time it took the electrons to travel from Paris to London. Right? This, is not prof this is not, I was going to say it's not profitable trading, it's extremely profitable trading for the investment banks, but it's not profitable from society's point of view. You know, when you it have... Quite damaging, can't it? You well, can it, have like a herd-like mentality and money can just shift and that's what happened in the Asian economic crisis, wasn't it? But well, it's what's happened in, in nearly every, every crisis, every crisis to, to, to some money. extent. Sorry, to, and, yeah. Well, the problem is that the, obviously if, if transactions are measured in nanoseconds, no human mind is being brought to bear. These are algorithms that are in a computer and because no mind is being brought to bear, also no economic fundamentals are being brought to bear. The trade is executed because of what's happened to prices in the minutes or hours before, not based on what somebody really thinks this asset is worth. So we've moved financial markets a long way away from their original purpose, and the idea of a Robin Hood tra tax is to get them back to that. So you pay doing a that. cost every time you do it. That's you pay a deal. very small cost every time you do it. And it generates enormous amount of money. Well, no, not a whole no. lot. Maybe 500 billion a year. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of it. it <laughs> a Australians call that laconic. <laughs> it generates a waterfall of money because these markets have got so big. These markets have become so staggeringly large. And I mean, do you think it's, I mean, I know that it's been tossed around, you know, and given some credence and talked about. I mean, I think Nicolas Sarkozy of France is probably the most recent person who's actually in a position to say, yes, we will introduce one of these, who's actually floated the idea. And I think Gordon Brown flirted with it for a little bit, but I think he's sort of backed off. And I think the United States has never been interested. Is that a fair way to sum up the political will? So, I mean, I suppose I'm asking, you know, the, the, it seems to me, reading the, the, the literature, that the hope for the development community, people who want to use some of this money to actually do something about economic justice, not all of it, but a section of this money could be used for that, um, are relying on, on, on there being sufficient political will. And I suppose I'm asking, do you think that's a faint hope? There's a lot of political will in Europe. Um, Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, is in favour. Sarkozy's in favour. You're right, Gordon Brown was in favour, but then he fell out of favour with the British people. Um, the European Commission um, has released a report last October, uh, which is the sort of administrative arm of the European Parliament in Brussels. That report was strongly in favour, so it's now sort of U U EU policy to the extent the EU has a, you know, a volition. 
Um, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of support for it in Europe. Europe's problem is what they're worried about is if they impose such a... Ta well, they can't impose it in Europe without Britain because the trading will move to London. And even if London did come on side, th they're still worried that the trading would move to the US. Um, I think if Europe... There are some politicians in Japan that are very in favour. If Europe was to impose it and East Asia was to impose it, in other words, Ch Japan and China, um, the US would have to impose it. Because what you'd have is on all the international transactions, you'd have the tax collected either at the European end or the Asian end, and you'd have transactions with the US being taxed without the US getting any share of that revenue. And that would be bizarre. So, you know, if, if, if Japan and China and, and Europe would, ag would agree to do it, the US eventually would have to come to the party, I think. So how important does an organisation like Oxfam feel in terms of your push for what should be done? What are the urgent priorities? Is this one of them or...? I think it's one of the, one of the key ways ahead, both for the reasons Ross has outlined and the sense of dampening down speculation and getting, hopefully getting a, an international financial system that actually works, works for economic justice, but also through generating resources. Uh, our estimate if 0.005% tax would generate something like $432 billion. Uh, that's much more than total aid flows. On every, every type of aid, much more on a global basis. It's much more than flows of remittances, which are, even, are actually greater than aid flows. So it, it's extraordinarily significant, because if we make an analysis of why the MDGs, which I think are... My, my view about the MDGs is that they're remarkably modest in their ambition. Uh, but Overall, they look like we're not going to achieve them unless there's a significant change. And one of the factors holding us back is uh, the resources. Is money. And the resources being applied in the right way. So money is needed. So the complicating, the additional challenge we've got is the impl uh, impacts of climate change uh, and the commitments which have been made from Copenhagen, which was uh, about another $100 billion. So if we don't have something like a Robin Hood tax, we are going to need a new way of fun funding both the achievement of the MDGs and funding the responses to climate change. And there have been various other options, but the beauty of the, the Robin Hood tax is the reasons that Ross gave, that it has an impact on speculation, it helps make the, the financial system work more effectively, and it uh, is would generate sufficient resources, which we can then use in a proper way. We've not yet <coughs> talked about climate change, but I, I do notice it is five to seven. So if anybody is interested in asking a question, they should think about it right now. <laughs> or in the, just while, we, while we're discussing, perhaps I'll ask in the panel a question. Um, Ross wants to, to follow up. So just have a think in the next couple of minutes and put your hand up shortly. And listening to Andrew, it just occurred to me, I don't think... There's not a lot of prospect that we're going to get that money we need for climate change adaptation and the extra funds we're going to get that we really need to address global poverty from the conventional sources. Is there? I mean, is that your feeling? That well, eight, eight budgets uh, are under, under pressure at the moment. Yeah. This, it's a mixed picture. We've got the British, the coalition, and a tripartisan agreement. Uh, Labor, Conservative, and Liberal Democrats are all united in boosting aid spending. But historic, uh, historically good donors like the Netherlands have cut back their aid from 0.8 to 0.7. So when you remember that Australia is only spending 32 cents out of every $100 of our national wealth and uh, the Dutch are cutting it back down to 0.7. But aid budgets are under pressure. And the scale of the challenge that we face cannot be met by aid alone. That, that's, that's a reality. Aid, aid is important, it's necessary, but it won't be sufficient. Are we talking about to, to address development needs? Are we talking about precisely to, to assist developing countries m make the adaptations they need to for climate change? It, I mean, it's both. And, and both both are, are, are very pressing needs, and there's an interrelationship between the two. Because climate change is affecting people's livelihoods, it's increasing the volatility of weather patterns is leading to an increasing number of humanitarian disasters. That has an impact on economic outcomes as well and social outcomes. So that and that's, both that's pressures... only part of the money that's needed because the other part of the money is so that people can have development, the kind of development the developed world's got.
world. Yep. Um, and, and, and can be given the money to, to allow them to make that kind of adaptation, yep. which is... The things we take for granted in this country, yep. you know, from clean water, to sanitation, to kids going to school, to access to healthcare. Were there any questions anyone out there would like to put to... Yes, the gentleman... Oh, there's a microphone coming, just one sec. What do you think the likelihood of um, something like the financial um, uh, tax um, in coming about? Look, we all love our families, we all love our children. Why is there such reluctance for institutions to um, do something that's so socially worthwhile and could be so socially responsible when most of us as, as individuals and members of communities would happily you know, lend a hand to our neighbour or to our friend. And what is the likelihood, do you think, this mentality will change in anywhere in the near future in which we would need it to, especially when we consider not only poverty, but also the, um, the environmental climate uh, and the changes that we're confronted with, with that? Who would like to uh, answer that difficult question? Uh, I, I'd, I'd say maybe two, two things. One, leadership. Uh, and actually, leadership with, uh, from our political leaders, from our national leaders, not just political leaders, trying to encourage people to bring out the best in the country uh, and to look at the long-term interests of the globe and of humanity as a whole. Uh, and secondly, it's, uh, for want of a better term, followership. It's people like yourselves making your views known and putting the pressure on the politicians. Now, I met um, Wayne Swan last May, and one of the issues, Tim Tostello and myself from World Vision saw, and one of the issues we had on the agenda was to talk about the Robin Hood tax. And he was quite clear, this is in the midst of the, uh, the mining super profits tax, the last thing he wanted to talk about was another tax. Um, quite understandable politically, but trying to encourage him to think a bit more uh, about the interests of Australia and the interests of humanity, uh, and to try to encourage all our political leaders to do that. Uh, demands people like yourself really making your voices heard. People, leaders can follow the people. Uh, it's not necessarily people following the leaders. We need, there are a lot, I think every, everything that I know about the Australian public is, it talks about generosity. Uh, Australians are judged to be amongst the world's most generous donors for international development. So those voices need to be heard loud and clear in Canberra. And uh, that gives me an op a, a possibility that we might achieve change. It requires standing up to vested interests. Uh, changing the trade regime uh, on a global basis requires uh, challenging vested interests. When a cow in Europe is subsidised to the tune of $2 a day, which is more than what a third of the world's population live on, uh, it means European leaders being uh, challenged to challenge some of the vested interests in their country. But it that question about leadership and good followership. Well, there is a view, and I think it has a lot of resonance in the community, whether or not people agree or not, that generosity be begins at home. And that's, that's what you hear said, generosity begins at home. And I think we've heard this um, precisely in, in relation to the floods now, yeah. that in a way our first priority should be dealing with folk who are affected at home. And I think in, in that climate, it's a harder battle. Yeah, but uh, it is a hard battle, but I, I think uh, it, it requires appealing to better people's better instincts. We are a rich country. We are one of the richest countries in the world. We have the capacity to walk and chew gum at the same time, to respond to needs in Australia, as well as making a contribution on a global basis. And more the point, having a more just and equal world, an equitable world, a fairer world, is in our national interest as well. So. It, it, it's a win-win. Be great if there's some more questions. Just, ah, did, Ross, did you want to... I just wanted to say... I'll come I to think, you in just a sec. I think Australia probably underestimates our vulnerability in a way and, and therefore underestimates our national interest in preserving our region. I mean, a, fa a failed state in our part of the world would be a, a major security disaster for Australia. You know, we have a huge interest in supporting responsible government and supporting, supporting functional economies in, in our part of the world. If we want to look at it from a selfish point of view, it's a whole lot better to make sure that every country that's within cooey of us can govern itself and function as a, as a good, strong economy than it will be to be trying to have military solutions to a Somalia on our doorstep. There was a question 
Do you have a black shirt? Yes. You. In the centre, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Right at the beginning, you all talked about the importance of equity and equality as an essential component or underpinning of economic justice. And for me, I see that as a real challenge for Australia because we don't talk about equity nationally as a vision for the future, and certainly not internationally. And even lately, we've had people trying to say that social structural justice will actually dampen or counteract generosity and benevolence and putting the two in opposition. So have you got any ideas for encouraging all of us to think about what type of world we want our grandchildren to live in rather than what's just best for our grandchildren individually? Perhaps I'll ask one of the women to answer this one, just because. Well, I, I, unfortunately, I, I don't really feel qualified to speak too much to the, to the Australian situation, but uh, you know, the question that you had uh, identified as being the sort of the overarching question, you know, who should get it? I couldn't argue more strenuously <laughs> for women receiving a greater share of what economic, whatever economic redistribution is, uh, it might be in order. There is ample evidence that countries where income inequalities between the gender, genders are greatest and economic opportunity are, are greatest have actually lower rates of GDP growth. So again, sort of to, to buttress Ross's point, uh, you, you need not have go too far away from your own self-interest to see a, a benefit in a more uh, e equal distribution between uh, men and women in terms of economic opportunity. So your answer to how do you persuade people to adopt the goal of equality is don't make, don't call it equality, call it self-interest. <laughs> is, is that the answer? Well, I don't think anything really sustainable actually has ever been done without a little enlightened self-interest uh, <laughs> underneath it. That's my, my personal view, but yeah. Amelia, do you want to contribute uh, any suggestions as to how a greater risk, you know, adopting the goal of equality could be, could be furthered? Yeah. No, actually, as I was listening to, to the conversation, uh, I, what I may, what I will say may not uh, be uh, um, likable to, to the people, but I'm thinking, as a Minister of Finance, just, just for that position, when we give out money, we always want to see results for it. And, and I say this all the time within my own uh, ministry. And so it, it makes me uh, have a feeling of how developed countries feel when they're giving money to, 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 to uh, the developing countries. I mentioned before, and I think it deserves a study. Why is it that it is not working? We need to, f to find out first. Eight billion dollars has gone into one tiny little country of one million people, and it did not produce results. It increased the poverty. So we need to know how, why, we need to understand that. Because otherwise people feel nervous of wanting to give more. Because you do want to see results out of your tax pay, uh, uh, taxes. Um, I have a little comparison, okay? I, as, as, as finance minister, I spent 1.8, about to be 1.9 billion in about three and a half years. There was some results there. The economy was growing double digit. Uh, poverty reduced by 9%. I want to know also why. What is it that we did that was different before? And I'm trying to understand that. And what I found out a little bit was one component was trust. Because I remember when we were about to allocate money for the internal displaced people, 150,000 people. Uh, as a result of 2006 crisis. We had refugees within our own country. And when the government was making a decision that we had to pay so much money per family to get them back to where they were and you know, help them, you know how normally you want to do like a project and then you want to get money in bits and pieces and check that it's working. And, and the prime minister said, if we're gonna go through this whole process, 
we will probably take more than 10 years and we'll never finish the process. So let's talk to the people. Let's talk to the recipients. And then there was a lot of dialogue, a lot of talk, and then there was an agreement. So the difference there was that these people were treated with respect as equal. So we trusted them, and then we gave them the money. What you do with the money if you decide to buy a motorbike instead of building your home, it's your responsibility. You are an adult. Now, that, that relationship is not there at the global level from country to country. Uh, and that has to be addressed. Because uh, if I apply what I say in my country, I say money is not the problem. It's how you manage it, how you are located. I tend to say the same thing at the global, but I don't want to say that too much because I don't know enough. But I have a feeling that maybe we need to manage it better. And maybe we have to learn from the experience that we've just gone through. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's up to all of us. Any other questions in the front row? Yes. Thank you. Australia has a strong focus on providing money to developing countries, yet, and Australia is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, along with the United States. Yet, two thirds of the world's poor are actually in our own backyards. Whilst maintaining focus on providing funds to developing nations, how do we address the issue of poverty in our own backyards? Just a punch of one myth. Yes, the Australian people are generous in their support of organisations like Oxfam and World Vision and IWDA. Uh, every, you know, probably the most generous in the world. But as a nation, as a country, as a government, we are currently ranked 16th which, you know, I barrack for Melbourne in the AFL. I know what it's like to be following a team bouncing around 16th and 17th. I, it's not pretty. <laughs> and that's where we are at, you know, at the moment. I would love Australia to actually be recognised that it's in our interest, but it's in our interest as being part of humanity to be more generous in terms of overseas aid. I'm not saying that's all we've got to do. Clearly, that's not what I'm saying, but I think... That, that, let's get the facts on the table, first of all. We are not particularly generous at the moment. So I think that's the first thing. The step that the government has committed, and it's still officially a bipartisan commitment uh, from the coalition, to increase aid spending up to 0.5% of gross national income by 2015-16 is to be applauded. The review which is taking place at the moment to try to make sure that it's effectively spent is also to be applauded. But that's still only spending 50 cents out of every $100 of our nation's wealth. It's not a huge amount of money. Uh, so that's, that's my first com the first comment I'd make. That, let's be clear about where we actually stand at the moment. Uh, and I think then we can start to build the... As part of trying to build the constituency, we can get that greater sense of focusing on uh, trying to tackle poverty and inequality both in our neighbourhood, but uh, also have a very... I think we need to have an expansive sense of our neighbourhood. If you're in Perth, Africa is part of your neighbourhood. Uh, I think we've got to put that into the equation as well. I see what if, I, if I can just follow on from that, Andrew, I think we need a much more expansive sense of our potential leadership role internationally. I mean, you know, I think second country in the world to give women the vote, heavily involved in the founding of the United Nations, uh, you know, a social incubator for all sorts of socially progressive things um, 40, 50 years ago, 30, 40, 50 years ago. These days, internationally, we generally just follow the Americans and we don't seem to have a, an appreciation as a nation that we are a middle-income country, we are a, a voice that, that gets listened to if it has some moral authority. Uh, behind the positions it's taking, and we don't take those in international fora the yeah. way we used to uh, a long time ago. You know, we we've, we've sort of have somehow got the idea that we don't have any potential influence, but I think we really do. Children in the front row. I think. Wearing the Make Poverty History T-shirt, yes. Are yeah. <laughs> oh, you waiting for the mic? <laughs> it's coming your way. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, if there isn't the political will at the moment to solve poverty, um, and there doesn't seem to be the individual will 
to make the political will? Is it education that is needed for our children, for the general public, to really push this and make the individual will the political will and then forward and, and solve this? And if so, have we got the individual will to get, the edu to get this as part of the education? Who'd like to answer? It's a, t a, a tough one. I, I think individually people are uh, tremendously engaged with this issue. So I'm, I'm actually not sure that, that's, that that is the answer. I do think that it is a question of, of national leadership, really. Um, and, and, you know, as was said, uh, alluded to earlier, the power, the political power of the banks in the United States is, is obscene in my, in my view. And they have not been brought to task uh, for bringing the uh, the world to the brink of, near a brink of destruction with the with the financial system. The compensation system has not been addressed. The regulatory reform in the United States is a a pale uh, imitation of what it could have been. So I I still feel that if there is not if there is not national leadership, political leadership, that. Uh, that the that the issues really won't be addressed, I and mean, maybe the individual will is to vote the people out who don't support these <laughs> these programs. But I, I do still think that we're looking at national leadership. Any other questions? I'm just concerned there are a lot of questions. Uh -huh. And um, gentleman in the black shirt, yeah, in the second row, and then and then the woman with the red shirt after, just so you know. That you're um, <laughs> sorry, I was just picking to... up on that uh, point that you made before. Uh, about uh, political will and, I, and it goes to a general point that I wanted to raise about who's going to make the decisions as in relation to the Robin Hood tax as to where does it go, how is it going to be collected and all of that. So firstly I'd like that to be addressed and uh, secondly uh, I see this as part of a, a bigger conversation that we need to have within this country but internationally that we've been very leery of having. It's a difficult political conversation to have about who's going to get this sort of money. Uh, nationally, we have a social contract which says that in Australia we're prepared to pay tax for certain things. But internationally, we haven't had that conversation and we don't know how to have it. So it's part and parcel of the same thing in terms of how do you decide who gets the money and how's it going to be collected. So all four of you might want to address that. <laughs> Ross, do you want to, as, as Mr. Robin Hood tax, uh, okay. start? <laughs> well, I think how to collect it is relatively easy. 20 years ago, how to collect it was very difficult. It was probably impractical to do 20 years ago. But what's happened in the interim is virtually all of these sorts of transactions are now cleared and settled on a few computer platforms. So that's the point where it would be easy to levy the tax. Obviously, to impose the tax, you need the consent of sovereign governments. In terms of leadership, to pick up on Mary Ellen's point, you probably honestly only need um, London and New York. If Britain and the US said we're going to have a financial transactions tax, the, the, tra the trading will not move from those two centres. They can do it and then everybody else will, will come on board and then in one swoop you have funded your MDGs, you've funded climate change adaptation, you've funded every pressing need facing humanity in one, and that's with half of it. You can still leave half of it for um, Sovereign, the sovereign governments to use in how they want to use it, but half of the, the, fl the cash flow from a financial transactions tax would address all of those, all of those needs. So, um, but your other points, I think, are excellent. We haven't had the discussion, the decision of how, do, who gets it. Um, you know, I think we, we have to have that before we have it, frankly, because you know people are nervous about where money goes. The Americans historically have been very nervous about you know, international institutions like the UN having other sources of funding than American contributions because it takes away their leverage. So there's a critical discussion to be had there. Does anyone else want to add to that? Or should we take another question? And I think re resources is part of it, but it's also how the money is spent and ensuring that, that it's spent in a highly accountable way with good quality, good policies. Uh, we don't want to return to what was called the Washington Consensus, which was a pretty toxic... Uh, cocktail of measures. Uh, so I think it's important that we look at 
how we generate the money, but also that we have as much time spent on how we spent, how the money could be spent properly. Can I just, just one point about leadership and the possibilities of change. I think we should actually just go back about three months and think, think about what the state of play was in Egypt, Tunis, Libya, all those countries. It's been an extraordinary change. Now, I'm not going to say that issues of poverty are the only thing. Not even, I'm not even going to say it's the key factor. I think it's about unaccountable and closed governments. But I think poverty is one of the driving factors in that change. So when we look for leadership, I think Australians, yes, should be ready to assume a more active role internationally, but we should also be quite willing to accept leadership coming from unusual places. Uh, you know, I, for one, in my job, I'm privileged to get out and see a lot of, a lot of Oxfam's programs around the globe, and I see a lot of real leadership from below, uh, which really gives me confidence that we can achieve the change that we need to achieve. Need to achieve. Uh, what happened in Timor over the last, over, from 75 through to through to 99 was extraordinary leadership. Uh, and I think maybe we've got to be open to those sort of models of leadership and uh, learn from that and then apply the lessons here in Australia. I did say the woman in the red shirt in the third row, yeah. And then I'll take one gentleman with the beard. Uh, thank you. I've been to many discussions like this over the last 20 years and I must say it makes me a little bit depressed to see the same issues coming back. I don't want to be... Uh, so critical of uh, people like Andrew have been on this for a long time and I do respect him for it but um, the Tobin tax was talked about many years ago I want to really put forward an alternative scenario or just questions at this point of the because, evening we're going to have to take just a question I'm afraid yes what if it was discovered that money was not the key thing in development but that Knowledge and skills were. Distribution, ge social distribution of knowledge and skills was more important than social distribution of money. Would things be any different? How would they be done differently? I think we have just been talking about money all the time as if it's the key element in development. And as Andrew pointed out, the events in, in the Middle East at the moment show us it's not. The, the Timorese resistance shows it, it's not. Uh, aren't there any other ways of addressing Poverty. We'll just take one quick response to that. Well, I think, I think I just, at least the development projects I've been involved with personally have, have all been about the imparting of knowledge and skills mm -hmm. to people in developing countries. You know, that's, that's the sustainable long-term thing that, that these countries really need to be able to, you know, govern themselves more efficiently. Thank you. All I would add to that is, is that I, I think part of the reason why microfinance has to at least some degree, it's not a panacea, but at least to some degree been an effective tool in the fight against poverty, is that it really isn't about handing money out, but about creating economic opportunity and allowing people to create their own economic opportunities. This, uh, this goes to the other working group that I had forgotten before. It was on <laughs> capacity development. It's a, it's a, a, a huge, big issue that is shared by many post-conflict fragile states. It is indeed a lot of knowledge is transferred, but is there absorbed capacity to absorb that knowledge and the skills so that it can be used to produce the results? That's a big question mark. And often it's not analyzed properly. It's like you enter like this and the other one is down there and it's not meeting. And it needs we need the bridge, and that bridge has not been found yet. It's in the process. And this will be the last question from the floor. A gentleman with a beard, I think, because we Thanks. need to close. Um, there's a debate going on at the moment inside the coalition um, about whether or not they're committed to the, the figure of 0.5% um, of, 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 of GNI by, by 2015, um, particularly to Andrew, but to the panel. Um, how, how, is, how can that debate, that debate be won um, in terms of the commitment to 0 0.5, and what, what can we here do to help win that debate? I think there is a debate taking place. It's a, not a, it's a bitterly disappointing debate. Um, one of the things that's 
is said from our contacts in the coalition, one of the things that is said to be uh, very important in helping stimulate the debate was a literal flood of emails uh, received making the point about charity begins at home and cut the aid budget and use it for flood relief. And the reality was that uh, there was, they did receive a lot of those emails and they received very few emails or letters or telephone calls from people who felt that we could do both. Uh, so I think in terms of trying to influence coalition decision making, um, and it, clearly given they're in opposition as just proposals at the moment they've got, then I think it's making your views known. Writing the letters, writing the emails, it sounds awfully boring, but I can assure you it does have an impact. And we've seen the impact it's had over the last four weeks. Actually, it'd be good if, it, you know, just take that question across the panel as the closer question, which is what do you, where do you see us going from here and what have people who've come here tonight, what can they do to help Ross? Well, to follow on Andrew's point, I think, is I think people who've come here tonight yeah, your local member of parliament needs to hear from you. I think the average member of parliament in Australia doesn't hear nearly enough about Australia's potential role, Australia's leadership role, what we can be doing, and that, you know, as a people, we do believe in helping our neighbours. You know, I think that's just not a message that gets up there to Canberra very much. And there is, you know, I'm sure there's a, a small minority who believe all, you know, problem, we've got enough problems, we should focus solely on those problems. But, you know, that one debate recently about the, the money for secular, promoting secular schools in Indonesia, uh, you know, as, a, as against religious schools, which are the alternative, I mean, if you're an Indonesian parent and you can't give your child breakfast and lunch, and there's a school that will provide your kid with breakfast and lunch, you will send your kid to that school. If there is a, only a religious school, even though you know that religious school is not going to give them the skills they need to get a job, you'll still send them to that fundamentalist school. If there's an option, you will probably take the option. You know, that must be the best money this nation could spend. If we have a fundamentalist neighbour immediately on our um, north and border, God help our national security. Now, there couldn't be a better dollar than we spend. The Canberra needs to hear those sorts of messages constantly, I think. And, and I say, as, as long as we're sending messages to Canberra, ask them that for any, any Australian dollar that, of aid that's given, that they make sure that there's a gender lens applied to that. Because funding that does have a, at least a perspective on what the impact on women will be of that, will it disadvantage women? Or will this be a, a assistance that can actually help women? Because the ability to, to leverage that dollar is so much greater uh, by targeting it towards a woman. The things that a woman will spend money on when she has economic opportunity are the long-term uh, intergenerational things that we've been talking about here. She will feed her children, she will educate her children, she will make sure that her entire family has access to health care, and she'll work on the immediate housing surroundings that she and her family are living in. So that would be my, my strong message from every man and woman in this audience, to make sure that there is a gender lens applied to, to development aid. And Amelia, closing, what would you I would say suggest? the devil is in the details. <laughs> That's the closing message, the devil is in the details. <laughs> Ask. <laughs> Examine the numbers. Ask details. And then you'll find the answer. Otherwise, it's rhetoric. A politician will always talk. <laughs> Sounds wise words to me. Can we thank everybody here? Uh, just, just before we thank our guests, I just need to tell you as a closer that this has been the 31st forum in, in a national series looking at key development issues affecting us as members of the global community. And video of tonight will be available on the One Just World website in the next few days. And in fact, you can watch all forums in the series, which is close to 100 opinions on poverty and development. If you register your name on the evaluation forms that are on your seat, um, or via the website, you'll receive an email whenever a new video is added to the website and get news of forthcoming forums. You can also add comments. So um, my apologies to people who didn't get to ask their question tonight. Please put your post on the forums so that your opinion will at least be registered. Um, and you can suggest ideas for future forums. 
But on behalf of One Just World, can I ask you to thank very much our guests, some of whom have travelled a very long way and all of whom have put a lot of time and given us their time tonight. Amelia Perez, Mary Ellen Iskaderian, Ross Buckley and Andrew Hewitt. Can you thank them very much?